a pleasure to now introduce to you Professor Upamandiri Ghosh, my senior from uh, Rochester. And uh, you are hearing about Mandel parameter, you are hearing about single photons. Almost all those experiments were done during the decade or during the times you were there. And uh, I was there from 83 to 88. And uh, you know, she was our senior, she used to come. And I, we all got a bit of training from her on coherent state and whatnot. And I was mentioning to you about the school in Hyderabad. She was an integral part of it. When she moved, she was working with Professor Mandel and Professor Varal was Professor Wolf's student. So she came to Hyderabad, subsequently shifted to JNU. And she has uh, you know, sort of established a school from which you have seen several products. You know, I, you, know you have to guess. Quite a few of them, Joey Goes, Suvasis, and uh, many of them. Now, uh, you know, from JNU, she has moved towards uh, director of uh, Simnata University, I think two terms, has given them good guidance. I can see a lot of students from there showing interest and some of them are part of this school also. And uh, uh, so, I, you know, I mean, you can read about her work. She was truly, you know, one of those persons who have seen and participated in the developments of remarkable development in quantum optics from Professor Mandel's group, from in which she was an integral part. So thank you and uh, uh, talk please, quiet. Thank you so much, uh, Prashant. It's always a pleasure uh, to be back. I wish this could be a physical meeting where I could probably also use uh, the Blackboard to uh, say a few things. But in the absence of that, let's just do with what we have. And I prepared a few slides and the students should feel free to stop. So there'll be a change of gear here. I'm uh, going to use a lot more physics concepts and give you maybe some of the basics. So my apologies to the experts. Um, there may be, uh, you know, this is not meant for the experts, but I think they, I'll bring it to the level of where we stand today in uh, quantum communication and quantum computation. What are the kind of typical resources as Prashant pointed out uh, that I have been fortunate to be part of exploration at the beginning. So let me get started. And then uh, if you, I know this is the lecture before lunch, if you get tired, just uh, interrupt and we'll have some discussions. I want you to start lightly. Uh, you know, I come from quantum optics and photons are everywhere, but I just wanted to uh, wake you up to say that the term photon uh, today is used in several different ways. And this has been happening for a a uh, lot of time, whenever you read a textbook, most common definition of a photon, what they mean is not really the photon of a quantum optician. They mean that it's a unit of electromagnetic radiation with energy h bar omega or h nu. The field is classical. Uh, in chemistry, in some parts of atomic physics, when you say multi-photon processes, in semiconductor physics, engineering optics, you don't really mean a quantum field, but you use the term photon, so be alert with that. It's often a catchy name for light. It doesn't even mean a unit of electromagnetic radiation. When you use it in photonics, photon echo and so on and so forth, it's just a, it's to say light, but you use photon to make it sound uh, interesting. The precise theoretical meaning of a photon is that it's a quantum of a single mode of the electromagnetic field. It fills the cavity of quantization. So the way we define it is when the annihilation operator A operates on an N number, state, n photon state, what you get is a n minus one, one photon gets annihilated and the amplitude you get out is a square root of n. This is how a theoretician would uh, describe a photon and this is very precise. Uh, experimentalists like me, I mean, I'm, I do both theory and experiment. Uh, it's more complicated. It's actually so complicated because when you describe a relatively localized packet of radiation, the moment you localize in space, you spread out in energy, you spread out in frequency space. So a uh, localized packet of radiation is essentially multimode. And even if it has an average energy H nu, and you think of it as a particle, often you do not have any analytic form for uh, certain sources. So whenever we talk about single particle experiments, we need to look very carefully. And I'm sort of bringing you back to where we all started and what all you need to be very careful with. So the precise theoretical definition should be in your mind. Experimentally, when you try to prepare such a single mode electromagnetic field, the challenges are 
quite a few. I'll talk about another very big challenge, but before that, let me take you again to the beginning to say, why do you want to quantize the field? I was talking about, you know, the field could be classical, most of the time it works. And you will have some lectures in this school as well. But, you know, in my way, when I started, it was uh, first to look for instances where a classical wave field fails to give experimentally observed results. The most common one is spontaneous emission. And everybody talks about it as if it's a normal thing. It is normal, but then, you know, if you believe in uh, quantization of the atom, then an energy eigenstate, which is a stationary state, should not really decay spontaneously, decay on its own. So if there is no external perturbation to change the energy spectrum, then spontaneous emission cannot be explained by thinking of a quantum atom and a classical field. Similarly, a spectacular one is lamp shift. You know, there have been Nobel Prizes on this. If you look at the hydrogen atom, 2s half and 2p half are supposed to be same uh, frequency or same energy uh, states. So even if you treat the atom by relativistic direct theory and use a classical electric field, 2s half and 2p half of H atom should have the same energy. But everybody has measured this and the energy difference between them is known in terms of frequency is about 1057 megahertz, so it's sizable. And this is what is known as the lamp shift. So the theory of it really long to work out and theory of it demanded that you cannot really have a classical electric field, essentially you need to quantize the field. Similarly, the intensity fluctuations in a laser, the laser in steady state behaves like a classical source, but the laser near threshold and its photon statistics and so on and so forth, these kind of things require you to do a quantization of the field. And what I'm going to briefly mention is two photon interferometry, which uh, Prasant mentioned in Rochester. This is what I started personally. And all of these things, there are several such fantastic examples where you have no option but to quantize the field. Now, uh, in, in very simple physical terms, this is really a case of uh, the phase in physics. You know, why we talk about complex quantities, uh, complex quantity which has a magnitude as well as a phase, and we represent it like a vector with two pieces of information in one uh, unit, a uh, direction as well as a magnitude. So in optics, wherever the dynamics of the phase of the field does not play any crucial role, you get away doing classical wave theories. And then you don't need to quantize the field. So this phase of the field is not really visible to uh, our naked eyes. So you have to do interference experiments to pick up the phase of the field. So interference and therefore a concept of coherence is inherent in quantum mechanics, not really in classical uh, optics. So the dynamics of the phase, when it plays a crucial role, you have no option but to go to the complex I, you know, the, the complex numbers. So the probability amplitude in quantum theory, which is a horrible name, that plays the role of wave amplitude in classical wave theory, and you have no option but to describe it in terms of these probability amplitudes. So the I, the complex I, becomes extremely important. But in real world, what are these imaginary things actually mean? More concretely, and maybe this has been covered already, but you know, this is, I grew up watching this field develop, and there are uh, you know, old Indian connections as well where you define the coherent state as the right eigenstate of the annihilation operator A. So uh, A is non-Hermitian, A dagger and A are not the same. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the definition of the coherent state alpha, and you can actually write it as a multimode expression. And you talk about in quantum optics, we define non-classicality in a basic way by going to uh, density functional, phase space density. It's possible using the peculiarities of the coherent state to actually have a diagonal representation of the density operator rho. Now, uh, otherwise an off diagonal representation is always possible, but in a, it's, a, it's possible to have a unique diagonal coherent state representation of the density operator. So in that the P of alpha that you see inside the integral is called the weight functional or the phase space density or often the glover schuler P function. Now, if this is a diagonal representation, so rho, uh, rho's representation in alpha 
this p function looks diagonal, it's diagonal, so it looks like a probability. If this p of alpha is not a probability density, it can be negative or highly singular, then the state is definitely non-classical. So this is how we start describing it, but I'll describe to you now what are the limitations of these kind of a probability density ideas. But before that, let me take you back to where the excitement started, some very counterintuitive quantum features, and something that you read in first year uh, undergraduate course or uh, even class 12 of physics, the double slit interference. If I imagine that I have a source S, which is shooting out photons or whatever you call them of one color, one frequency, and it's in, in this setup, you have only one photon at a time from the source to the detector D. A and B are tiny holes on a screen. So if I close, say, the second hole B, uh, supposing the detector, I get 1% of the time clicks. And if I close the other one, A, and open B, then assume a symmetric situation without any loss of generality, you get 1% of clicks at the detector D. But when you open both, depending on the position of the detector, sometimes you get no clicks at all. So the detector doesn't detect anything. That means light through A and light through B can add up to give you zero. So this is a peculiarity of optical interference and opening a second hole does not always increase the amount of light reaching the detector. You sometimes get more clicks than the expected 2%, one plus one, and maximum is 4% or no clicks at all. Now you know this already, but I am just referring back to a very basic book, Feynman Lectures, volume three. In the first chapter, he talks about it and he calls the double slit experiment interference as uh, that it's something that has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. It contains the only mystery. We cannot make the mystery go away by explaining how it works. We'll just tell you how it works. <laughs> so people who say that they understand this are actually lying. So um, it's, it really contains the basic peculiarities of all quantum mechanics. So if you shoot one photon at a time, you keep observing on the screen, on the detector screen, then you would get one tiny dot appearing randomly, apparently. But then it has the probability amplitude of going through A and B. So one photon having the probability of going through two paths. So Dirac had stated this, and that's a very famous statement that we should think of this single photon as being associated with both paths simultaneously. The two indistinguishable paths, source hole A and detector, source hole B and detector, these probability amplitudes interfere, right? And that's how you explain single photon interference. Now, it's some kind of a Sai Baba effect <clears throat> that I'm here now in Delhi. You are in Calcutta. If I could be a quantum particle with a wave function spread from here to Calcutta, then it's a possibility that some of you would see me at A and some of you would see me at B. And so this, these kind of crazy things are uh, normal in quantum mechanics. And if you try to determine whether I'm at A or when I'm at B, then in the course of your measurement, you would force it into one of the other beams and no interference would occur. So this creates two major problems, no reality that is independent of observers or measurement. When you assume there is a, there is a world, uh, a real world, and by doing physics and measurement, you are actually extracting pieces of information about the world. That's not really true, because if you try to measure, your measurement alters the reality. There is no locality, so extent of the wave function. What if many photons or many atoms, which are quantum objects, can be linked in a single wave of light or matter? Now you would ask then, as physicists do, what is the use? We try to understand all of it so that we can use the knowledge to control the phenomena. So what is the use is what uh, you must have guessed is what I'm going to come to. <clears throat> so Dirac did say that each photon interferes only with itself interference between two different photons never occurs. Now, uh, my experiments violated the second statement, though I stick to Dirac's you know, interpretation of interference. Now, two photon interference cannot simply be described in terms of interference of two independent photons, but must be envisioned as superposition among indistinguishable two photon amplitudes. This is absolutely crazy, but this is how you actually are explaining a simple thing like two photonic interference. Now, uh, we continue to work on this uh, even after my uh, PhD thesis. 
uh, you use light in quantum states. So as I said, quantum states are those that are crazy when the state of the field is not describable as a simple mixture of coherent states. So if you use quantum states as independent sources, and there are several such examples, you pos it's possible to make two photons being emitted by independent sources interfere. And this is the origin of entangled sources that you see today everywhere. Now, uh, the theory, of, of course, you need to understand. I worked a lot on spontaneous parametric down conversion, SPDC in short. Those times were different. You know, the crystals were small. The conversion efficiency was really, really low. And I did the theory first. And I used Trunja picture calculations. I urged the students to understand these differences because you have to choose the most suitable one for you. And many people after me uh, followed this description, Shunja picture calculations to describe SPDC. Now, uh, some people attempted to do Heisenberg picture calculations. And I, I would have preferred that because it's easier to compare those to classical optics when you take the dynamics into the field operator. But uh, it was due to Mitchell who showed that both are equivalent. Uh, this came out, he's in Barcelona. Uh, this came out much later in 2009. But uh, what exactly is the point? Point is that what we found out is that two photons can never be detected at two points separated by an odd number of interference fringes, despite the fact that one photon can be detected anywhere. So it's still the quantum mechanical interpretation of interference due to Dirac that you have to interpret that one photon must have come from one arm, and one, the second one from the other, but we cannot tell which came from which. Two indistinguishable paths, and you have to add <coughs> the probability amplitudes corresponding to these two paths. So these are now textbook examples. This is a very good book that came out and second edition was in 2005 uh, called The Quantum Challenge. Uh, it's a thin book that spares three pages on the experiment. It also has come out in popular science, uh, the age of entanglement and so on and so forth. Uh, so this became a standard source of entangled photons. What you do is when you pump this nonlinear medium with, uh, say, a UV laser, uh, once in a while, spontaneously, one photon fissions into two, which are traditionally we call pump and idler photons. And they came out in, uh, you know, when you meet the phase matching constraints, which are nothing but momentum and energy conserving relations, then uh, you get infinitely many such terms. And it's possible to then see these photon pairs emitted along intersections of the cones which are then entangled in polarization. So this is what you see when you're looking into the, uh, the crystal. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, this is how these rainbow of colors that surround the pump beam in a cone that you can see if you choose your colors carefully. Now, uh, the quantum correlations that everybody is talking about is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance uh, in 1935 onwards. As if one particle effectively knows something about another particle instantaneously, even if those particles are separated by a great distance, right? This is what the physics of entanglement is. We have worked on various systems on that, but that's, uh, you know, if you are interested, you can take a look at uh, those articles. But uh, the, the, uh, let me tell you what is the use. So if you, you can measure, of course, uh, sub picosecond time intervals between two photons by this kind of photo order interferometry. You can test quantum mechanical non-locality via Bell inequalities. And first time, a Japanese team showed interest in first time in communication using, instead of single channels, use correlated channels in the presence of high background noise. And I think this was the first time that uh, this became uh, clear to physicists. Now, a quantum optics started exhibiting states of light with no classical equivalent. You'd read a lot in Kimball's uh, original works and the photons school states, we have worked some with Girish Agarwal on this, twin beams that I did, EPR states involving one or two modes of the electromagnetic field, much later, multi-mode fields. Again, Jeff Kimball came up with the quantum internet idea. Something that you, I'm sure in this conference you have seen a number of times is what I'm talking about. So where do you go to? The concept of quantum parallelism that is exhibited by the single photon that I talked about. The single photon has the possibility of going through parallelly through hole A and hole B, right? That can be exploited, that's the use. You construct a quantum computer and you know this, 
uh, a qubit instead of a bit. And uh, it's like combinations of no and yes, upstairs, downstairs, a cat which is dead and alive at the same time till you measure. Once you measure this nice thing about quantum mechanics, uh, all these properties, this uh, goes away. So it's a very private world of nature where quantum mechanics works. So I think the major challenge that I'm going to explain and give you the physics of is how to produce, observe, and make use of such powerful information-rich states and make use of is really the problem here. So this is what is referred to as the quantum challenge, that quantum mechanics shows up in small enclaves within the classical macro world. The behavior of individual constituents like atoms and photons, the behavior of these are described by quantum mechanics, but these particles are rarely isolated. And as they interact with the environment, they lose their peculiar quantum character. So the essential question in quantum physics is the mechanism of transition between the quantum and the classical world. Is there a door? Do you open it and then transition from the quantum to the classical world or the classical to the quantum world? How is it that I don't see the peculiarities of quantum world in our day-to-day -day life? And in very simple terms, I, we really do not see a macroscopic object like a cat, which is both dead and alive at the same time. So, but if you are, can make use of this, then maybe it would be understood. So what is the quantum challenge? To make a measurement, one not only needs to keep a quantum system isolated for a long enough time, this is the duration of the measurement is determined by this, but you also have to probe it so delicately that the measurement itself leaves the system's quantum nature intact. Now, this was known as the problem even to Schrodinger. So this is about 1952 or so, and he called it post-mortem physics. So when you explore, when you measure, you destroy the object under investigation, it becomes a dead object that you are uh, post-mortem. So I think this is something that was known, but why are we talking about it today? Because though it's very tough and challenging tasks, uh, because of this reason, and I think I, I will give you some references of last two, three months, uh, the quantum states disappear, the process is called decoherence, and that happens in the presence of environmental noise. And then error corrections are difficult. There is a, a nice article by Professor Shankar Sarma, is in Maryland uh, called Quantum Computing Has a Hype Problem. This came out end of March and it appeared in MIT Technology Review. Uh, that's the reference that's on your screen. Where also he mentions this, that the hype is because of this decorrence problem because quantum computation relies on entanglement of large quantum states to perform efficient calculations. Now, such states will interact with the environment, nature of the interaction and the time scale over which it acts are critical inputs. So you need to consider two points as I have already stated, but I'm refining them here. The problem of what physicists call damping and defacing in quantum systems and time irreversible outcome of a measurement. Now, how well do we understand the process of loss of coherence and emergence of classicality? I'll touch upon it. I'll not get into the details of it. I've spent a decade exploring such points. And here is the summary. Uh, when a system, a quantum system is coupled to its environment, energy may be irreversibly be transferred from the system to the environment. That's familiar dissipation. You lose energy. The second thing that happens that is associated with it uh, always is uh, with dissipation is diffusion. The fluctuating force exerted by the environment on the system, which causes fluctuations on the degree of freedom. And this is, for example, very familiar Brownian motion. Now, these two effects are common for classical systems as well. So these two effects occur for both classical and quantum systems. But in the quantum domain, there is an additional feature. As the system and environmental degrees of freedom get entangled, a coherent superposition of quantum states may be destroyed in a process. That's what is called decoherence. And I'm going to explain this, but what you should remember and end of it, because you can always look up the papers, the physics should be in your head, that there are time scales that you need to worry about. And in my mind, there are four time scales that you need to worry about. One is the time scale associated with the natural frequency of the isolated system. Uh, then the second is relaxation time scale corresponding to the frequency determined by the coupling strength. How, how strongly or weakly your system is coupled to the environment. Weak, of course, is better in general. 
memory time associated with the highest frequency present in the environment. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the third time scale that you need to worry about. So you need to figure out what kind of dynamics you're going to use. Can you do Markov or do you need to go to non-Markov and so on and so forth. And the fourth one is a scale H <coughs> by beta, uh, where uh, beta is uh, you know, uh, inverse of KBT. So uh, this is associated with the temperature of the environment, uh, which measures the relative importance of quantum to thermal effects. And it's important. So these four time scales you should be aware of before you do this. I give you a very simple example for from way back. Uh, it was Zurek's work in the beginning, uh, which we corrected actually. But consider a very simple two-level system or a two-spin half. You know, a two-level atom can be modeled very easily by a two-state system like this, spin half. And let the apparatus also be a detector which goes, which flips depending on what it's detecting. So you write a density matrix of this combined system given by this psi that I have written and put some arbitrary amplitudes A and B in there. So you have to choose your basis correctly. If you use this basis, up, up, and down, down, the density matrix looks like what I have written. Now mod A square and mod B square are familiar. This is the probability of finding the, uh, the, the system in the upstate, probability of finding the system in the downstate. But the ones in blue, A star B and B star B, these off-diagonal terms, correspond to superpositions of macroscopically distinct outcomes. This is something you can't explain classically, okay? So these are essentially quantum features. So there is a, in quantum mechanics, in textbooks, you talk about a reduction uh, mechanism, it's not dynamical. And you say that this pure row becomes a mixed row where the, you know, the, the off-diagonal elements are set to zero. This is von Neumann reduction, and you can give it uh, some meaning, but there is no dynamics that tells you how this happens, that the off-diagonal terms, A star B and B star A, suddenly are set to zero. Now, there is, of course, a second reduction happens. Students often ask me, so I put it down, because this rho R is easily interpretable like classical probabilities. Is there still a statistical mechanical kind of a, an understanding of probabilities? The second reduction of is mod A square becoming one and mod B square becoming zero or the other way is uninteresting for our discussion in quantum mechanics because it corresponds to the collapse of a classical probability distribution as a result of acquisition of knowledge about the system. So I'm worried about the first part which sometimes you don't find, it's outside quantum dynamics. So if you believe in quantum dynamics, you don't need to actually uh, bring in elements from outside in your pocket and say, this is how reduction happens. So I spent a lot of time working on the dynamics of this reduction, believing in quantum mechanics. And there is a lot of papers that you would see uh, from uh, Shubhashish Banerjee have already lectured or going to lecture. He was a student with me uh, at JNU. So how does classical behavior emerge from quantum dynamics? So this really had to be looked at and I don't have time today to get into that. But in spite of this big challenge, what uh, you know, has prompted Shankar Das Sharma to call this a hype, we have made spectacular progress in manipulation of quantum states of matter and in encoding transmission and processing of quantum information and that's our motivation today. I can cite many Nobel Prizes, but I put this up for two reasons. 2012 Nobel Prize was given to Sarah Jarosh and Dev Weinland, uh, who I happen to know personally. And the citation is very interesting. It says for groundbreaking experimental methods <coughs> that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. So they were able to do it but the second reason that I want to show is for our students to be aware of this photograph. You know, I have taken this photograph from Sal Jaroshi's Nobel lecture, where you see in the same lab room, <coughs> 46 years before Sal Jarosh got it. So uh, the second figure is uh, Cohen Tanuji, who got the Nobel Prize in 1997. Uh, after that, in the middle is Kassler, who this was. Kastler's Nobel Prize announcement in 1966, and uh, who was uh, Cohen Tanuji's teacher. 
And next to Kastler on the right hand side is Sarge Hirosh. So three generations of Nobel Prizes from the same lab. It happens when you stick to a problem and you probe it deeply and you don't always need to do really superficial work. And this should be inspirations for everybody. What a tradition of physics research. But uh, you know, I'm going to give you uh, an example of one element of this from our work because I don't have time to cover a whole lot and I know you'll be saturated soon. So I have taken it, but I'm not going to follow this nature physics quote from Everett uh, and uh, collaborators that what, you know, what we all know is that photons interact, do not interact with each other. If you look at Maxwell equations, they are linear. Photon-photon interactions are not possible, but such interactions become possible only when you bring in a source, a material medium. So that's our ultimate goal, is to make individual light particles of photons interact with one another. Then only the photons will become entangled, right? So you really can try to confine the particular uh, photons in a particular material long enough to make sure that they interact, or there are other nonlinear processes that I talked about like SPDs. So what I'm going to talk about is a similar one, but very different, uh, similar physics, but very different output is in quantum, uh, in uh, quantum memory. What are those? So let me do a little jump and talk about something you may have heard of, a process called electromagnetically induced transparency. As the name suggests, materials that are otherwise opaque, that means, when resonant light tries to pass through a material, it gets absorbed, right? So the material is opaque. That absorption, if you can transfer this to an induced transparency, how do you do such cancellation of resonant absorption? So something that was opaque suddenly becomes transparent when you control it with another laser. Now, a nice thing about optics is that, uh, I'm not talking about plasma, that when you turn off the control laser, it's back to square one. So you don't change nature, you don't do anything permanent damage, and that's what. It's an old concept, but then it came back uh, with our work. And uh, those of you who have not seen this, a very easy way of conceptualizing this is when I have a two-level atom uh, separated by a energy of H bar omega naught, and I shine a laser of frequency omega, red omega, then Typical absorption and dispersion profiles look like this. If you look at Jackson or any other book, they look like this. Delta is the little detuning between your uh, natural frequency of the atom and the laser frequency. When delta is zero, maximum absorption happens. So you lift the population upstairs, so the light that is shining from the laser gets absorbed. And uh, by Kramer-Skronik relation, you have a causal relation to dispersion. The dispersion profile looks really funny like this. What happens when I add a third level and a control laser, which is powerful? The dotted line, the previously shown two level system uh, profile, gets modified drastically by this. So where you had maximum absorption, you now have a transparency window and dispersion profile also gets changed with a very funny slope through the delta equal to zero line. And uh, whenever you have so a transparency window of this kind, uh, this extreme positive dispersion in this window uh, refers to something that we call slow light. Now, slow light, if you think of it, is nothing new. If, you, if light in free space has three times a tenth power eight meters per second speed, then when it goes through a material medium, you know there is something that you learn in high school called refractive index. And because of that, it slows down. So the speed of light inside a material with refractive index n is c by n, right? So, but that's n is normally 1.5, three semiconductors, maybe six, but not more than that. Here we are talking about the group index ng of the order of 10 to power five, 10 to power six, 10 to power seven, and can it really get that slow that we stopped light? And that's the question I'm asking right now. What is the purpose? when it comes to quantum computation, this is then becomes a memory. I code my qubit in my laser omega, and when it comes to the atom, it gets absorbed and uh, not absorbed, but it gets transferred into atomic spin resonances. And then 
it gets actually stopped inside the material. So that's what a typical memory would look like. And that's what I'm going to give you a flavor of. Now, this is again quantum interference. And that's why I started with an old work because the phenomenon of interference confronts us with two fundamental quantum ideas that are probabilistic interpretation. You know, there is no way out of it. It's not a uh, lack of knowledge like coin tossing where you're not looking, you can look. This is in principle not knowable. So probabilistic interpretation. And the second is what I've been harping on following Dirac is addition of probability amplitudes for indistinguishable paths. And what the phenomenon of EIT that I'm going to talk about, again, has these two principles embedded in it, but not in the physical space, unlike in interference. This is in the energy space as you would see. The physics of EIT, I can explain by saying, what is the physics of EIT is that the probe that I'm showing there somehow is on resonance with the, uh, the, the probe laser, but the material is actually not getting transferred upstairs, not absorbing anything. So absorption of the probe, which is on your right-hand side, that can happen to two channels. One is a direct one, population gets lifted from B to A. Don't take it literally. This is a cartoon. I'm talking about the possibility of the path. So there is a path direct, which is B to A, and an indirect path mediated by the coupling, which is B to A to C and A. So these two paths interfere uh, destructively when your coupling intensity, the control laser intensity is high. Uh, omegas are Rabi frequencies here, but it doesn't matter, matter of detail. So this is how you cancel the absorption of the probe and EIT happens. So as in all interference experiments, there is also an inherent coherence lifetime that you have to worry about coherence time. And in this case, this fragile quantum effect are limited by the coherence lifetime of the lower levels. And it's called a Raman coherence time between the levels B and C. So uh, this is uh, quite amazing that when you don't have the coupling laser, the control laser, then the probe gets fully absorbed. And uh, you know because of absorption, the material is not transparent. The moment you turn on the coupling, the material becomes transparent because probe absorption gets canceled by this quantum interference effect. Now, I am not going to bore you with the details of it, but you can actually, rather than giving the uh, physical explanation I just gave, you can work it out. You uh, have an interaction of the two beams with the three-level atom. You can work it out and figure it out. What are the eigenstates? The interesting eigenstate is the one that I have written in red. It's called a dark state because the poor thing in case of C uh, the EIT is really the lower state B. <laughs> it's called a dark state because it's totally on resonance, but the poor state does not see light. It cannot see light, therefore it doesn't get absorbed because that absorption gets uh, canceled. Now this is extremely exciting. So what I have said in summary of this is in this slide, that a general EIT scheme would need a three-level atom of this kind, where the absorption from the level B to the upstairs level A is uh, completely canceled out when you follow the EIT condition of two photon resonance, the state B then becomes a dark state. It doesn't see the light and therefore uh, this effect happens. This is slide looks uh, you know, a little crowded, but the last bit what I've written, I'm going to show you an animation of that. So is it possible to stop and restart light at will? Uh, so photons with zero rest mass cannot be at rest, so you cannot stop them. But light plus matter interaction of the kind I talked about creates what we call rest photons. In this case, they are called polaritons. So they're not bare atoms, not bare photons, but how uh, the photons get dressed by the atom. So these joint oscillations of light and collective atomic dipoles have non-zero rest mass, and therefore they can be at rest. They can have zero velocity in a moving frame of reference, for example, a moving medium. Now, uh, again, uh, last month, uh, there is a paper in PRL that has come out. It's not the same method, so don't uh, confuse it with that. But which talks is a very interesting paper, talks about self-stopping of light via self-interaction that's mediated by resonant nonlinearity in a homogeneous medium. So uh, if you're interested, you can read it, but I'm not going to talk about um, that paper of self-stopping. But what I'm talking about is a general scheme that incoming light can carry information that's expressed in, by changes in modulations 
of x frequency amplitude or phase or all when the light stops the information is stored in collective atomic excitations just like information is stored in the electron me memory of a computer this lasts till the raman coherence states to access the information the control laser is turned on and then it comes out uh, i can show you this uh, essential idea of a quantum memory it's like a you know transforming a flying qubit to a stationary qubit and vice versa but the basic point is is at will when i wish to i store it when i wish to retrieve it i turn on the laser and i retrieve it so this is a, a cartoon of the protocol based on eit so when i start uh, you have this three level system right in the middle all it has been prepared very well so all all population as the probability of being in the lower state of the probe state b i turn on the control laser first it's a, you know it's illuminating everywhere and then i turn on the probe pulse the probe pulse comes it comes into the material and it gets stopped there at that point i turn off the control laser so the state of the input light the probe light is stored in the raman coherences in the atomic medium and then on demand retrieval would mean i turn on the control again and then out comes the probe laser exactly the way it had so this is the idea of atomic memory using eit where you can stop and store information so uh, because photons are uh, difficult to localize uh, but they are good for long distance uh, propagation so i'll talk about that so what is the theme of eit atomic memory you need to control the behavior of an atomic medium to switch between transparency and enhanced absorption absorption i have not talked about but you can do the same thing and you can create even logic gates which i am not talking about today so the process relies on quantum interference between multiple paths of absorption or emission which can be constructive or destructive at different frequencies and so this is really dramatic the first trick to realization of such a scheme is to select a simple usable atomic level and that's not easy at all so what we have done is uh, really talked about this coherent ma manipulation and you realize that two interesting features in embedded in the scheme i'm talking about these are not very fragile quantum coherences why they're not fragile because i'm talking about a bulk atomic system and the system i'm going to talk to you about i mean i'll just give you some references also Uh, is really not a cold system this is at room temperature that was my interest in particular so we worked with helium 4 and this is the phd thesis start of phd thesis of joey ghosh who is now at iit delhi and she would be talking to you i think next week sometime uh, she did her phd at jnu uh, so you select uh, i would not tell you the details of it but the main point that you need to remember is this is room temperature helium 4 helium 4 was chosen because it has the nuclear spin i is zero so the level scheme is kind of simple the metastable state behaves like a ground state it is a very long lifetime 8000 second but for our purposes the lifetime of the metastable state doesn't really matter it's very long but what matters is how long are these atomic uh, elements going to stay in the laser line and we have been able to actually select a uh, lambda system a clean three level lambda system using the 23p1 uh, by using the nice property of polarization without any magnetic field in this case so there are many advantages of uh, helium four and everybody thought that in room temperature we will not be able to see this quantum coherence effect but we could see and what is supposed to be the devil of the case collisions that you have at room temperature that turned out to be helping us but of course there is a compromise to be done this was done uh, through uh, in the french collaboration with this very indian looking uh, friends of mine fabian bretnecker who i worked for a very long time with and fabian goldfarb who was mainly the person in helium 4 and this has been uh, through two in the french projects uh, in 2009 and 12 and even after i moved to snu as the vice chancellor uh, i have continued and uh, you know we have really got some nice results in there a lot uh, you know i don't expect you to go through these papers but it's very interesting to talk about the process one thing i must tell you that when you are transmitting information from uh, okay th these are the early papers uh, that we have worked on and uh, done the theory of this in this so uh, the idea was that you use photonic channels as i said they are appropriate for quantum communication over distance 
because of its fast transmission speed and heat interaction with the environment, but they're difficult to store. <coughs> so we use atomic nodes, which are good quantum memories, but difficult to transport over distance, right? So the quantum information system is like an atom photon network. The biggest problem that we try to address and more work needs to be done in here is the information transfer problem. You are sending a quantum information which you do not know anything much about without knowing from the photonic system to the atom and you are retrieving it exactly the same way uh, if the system is any good from atom to the photon again without knowing what you are, what the information is. So there is a transfer problem and everybody understood this has to be done adiabatically, slowly, but we asked the question, how slow is slow? And I think there's a lot of insight in this paper for a particular reason we submitted in Tamana, but I think there's a lot of follow-up work needs to be done to understand this transfer process in uh, CED. Uh, again, uh, today is not the time to go through all of it, but uh, there's a lot of prospects of PIT quantum memory. And I bring you to this year, in March end, uh, there was a review article by this Chinese group. It's a pretty good review. Talks about EIT quantum memory for non-classical states of light. But before that, uh, a lot of groups were working on this. In Weizmann Institute of Science, I, I quote this, because this came out in 2018. They were able to use room temperature cesium uh, with the long storage times of one second, because they could actually get to a decoherence free substrate of spin states. I feel this is the future. This is the way we need to go because cold things, I mean, I'll show you where this system is. They're good for fundamental work for understanding, but a field level system really needs to uh, work under conditions where maintenance will not be such a pain. So that's where the problem is. That's the quantum challenge. You know, it's, that's the problem with quantum mechanics. Now, quantum memories have also been realized in warm atomic cell, as I pointed out, cold atoms and solid systems. And it can be, this EIT mechanism has been applied to store and release single photon squeeze states. These are the coded information, single photon or squeeze states or entangled photon pairs or multipartite entangled states of optical modes. So uh, if you are interested, you can take a look at this review, easy to read, and it leads you to other examples that I may not have had time to do. Okay, I, I'm running out of time, but let me just tell you something very exciting. While we are doing it, we came across a, a funny aside that when you look at this expression that I've been writing, group velocity Vg is C by Ng, where Ng is the group index. So uh, Ng, as I pointed out for slow light, is really much larger than one. It could be 10 to the power seven. So your group velocity inside the material is much smaller than C, the free space speed of light. Now, can you do it the other way? It's quite possible to do if you choose the right uh, frequency difference that you can get fast light. By fast light, you mean Ng is negative, is less than one, sorry. So if Ng is less than one, then group velocity would be greater than C. Or you can get backward light when Ng is negative, your group velocity would be negative. Now, these are very funny concepts, highly counterintuitive. When you are in school, you are told that there is an Einstein causality concept, right? You cannot uh, send any information faster than the speed of light. Otherwise, there will be you know, counterintuitive paradoxes like the grandfather paradox, where you kill your grandfather um, by moving faster than the speed of light. Now, there is no conflict. I mean, I'm just giving you the answer that it doesn't violate causality. We used to think that it's not the phase velocity, but it's the group velocity that carries information. Now we know that group velocity doesn't carry information propagation. Information propagation is better described by discontinuous front velocities than by the group velocity. You turn on something, so there are discontinuities. So your old dispersion theory, you cannot really do the way you are used to do. Backward light would mean you, can, you come out before you even enter the material. So all kinds of weird stuff is because we are trying to impose a description that's not valid when you are coding an information. So I think these understandings are coming. I give Shuvashish Banerjee a problem to look into and Himadridhar later a problem to look into what is the quantum version of causality. That's another story, another time. Uh, so we had fun probing this and some, and then there are other ways of creating a transmission resonance 
One is what we probed a lot called coherent population oscillation. Uh, you know, one student of mine uh, worked now in the US for a long time now uh, on this system. So you can actually create a tripod, which is like a double lambda. So you have double EITs. So the theory becomes a little more complicated. You have a four level atomic system, three classical fields with detunings, three Raman coherences, two dark states, et cetera, et cetera. So you have fun trying to manipulate transmission and absorptions. And we did a lot of work in this, uh, in this polarization dependent manipulation using the same helium-4, but slightly different level scheme. So I'll not get into the details of it, but again, there's a lot of application where the system can be useful as a polarization dependent switch on off on off in the presence of a magnetic field, a small magnetic field that you created. Uh, this can be used for uh, light storage in metastable helium. Uh, and this is uh, optically detuned. So there's some work that we did. Uh, I was very proud of this. This is the last PRL in 2017, February, where not like the polar return, but in CPO for a population oscillation, we, uh, we discussed light storage by introducing a, a new quantity, which we call popular return, a mixture of populations and feet. So this is in analogy with the dark ray polar return that uh, you know, Lukin's group used for EIT. So this memory relies on populations. So it, it's robust to dephasing effects. So it doesn't have the usual Raman coherence optical storage protocol, but that's another story, but very interesting stuff coming up. So how close are we to realizing the dream of quantum information processing? We have been hearing many uh, theoretical talks. I'm going to give you a status update from physics. Now, of course, there are jokes, right? How is your quantum computer prototype coming along? It's like, great. So the, the, the scientist says the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. And then the, the boss says, can I observe it? And that's a tricky question, but that apart, They've been real systems. So devices based on trapped ions, that's the first qubit, and that was in 1995 by Dave Weinland and Chris Monroe and others and uh, in NIST Boulder. And then you must have seen really the, the very complicated pictures, but nothing very clear of solid state superconducting circuits by Google and even IBM. Google has been also doing it, but the 127 qubit IBM Eagle processor is currently regarded as the most powerful. They are very clumsy. Now, why it's in interesting to have this conference today is uh, atomic quantum processors came up uh, in April. And there's two back-to-back -back papers in Nature from Harvard University and University of Wisconsin Medicine that talked about neutral atoms as qubits. Now, this is extremely important. And I call it a milestone because atomic quantum computers may be easier to scale up than the two earlier technologies. So this is as good as you know April this year. And uh, you would find a review of that in Physics World, which is given on top, that atomic quantum processors make their debut. But uh, the, this is the typical Wisconsin medicine setup, a multi-qubit entanglement and algorithms on a programmable neutral atom quantum computer. Looks very complicated. And I worry about how this is going to translate to a field computer. Now, hot from the oven also, you have, you know, end of May, there's a qubit teleportation uh, scheme that came up from Delft, Netherlands, between non-neighboring nodes. So this really is a future quantum internet that would be powered by quantum teleportation, you know, that I talked about, the spooky action at a distance, entanglement, and everything that we talked about. This could provide a new kind of encryption that is theoretically unbreakable. So uh, people are now talking about hybrid comp computing. What's the right combination of pure quantum, quantum inspired and classical computing? Because you don't need to go to pure quantum computer to solve all kinds of problems. And seems like uh, a lot of hype even to people even today. But you know, I showed you the status update to tell you this is the most exciting time to be in this and particularly in an experimental and when experiment and theory go hand in hand, useful applications to come out. So moral of the story today is that theory and experiment are really going hand in hand, as is the evolution of physics uh, defining uh, this. And useful applications are coming out. Will it someday be every problem be solved and we'll all be jobless? It's uh, unlikely, and I, I believe the scientific methodology would continue. And that's the moral of the story. Be at it, and then you'd be discovering new 
frontiers of it. Neutral atoms today in this field looks like highly promising. So I was able to give you a, a glimpse into the atomic memory systems, but uh, you know the other systems you may please look up. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I'd love to take up some questions if there is. Any. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Whoever wants to ask, please open yourself and ask questions. Maybe just, just to start, you know, this uh, 2017 PRL paper, which you mentioned, so is it like a, so, you know, periodic soliton kind of thing? Uh, yeah, the idea started from there. Hmm. But then uh, <clears throat> looking at this idea of a polariton. Hmm. So these are uh, combined uh, excitons of, uh, you know, photon and the atomic excitation. Hmm. So what we found, but uh, spin excitations at the Raman decay time. So here it's like a population and field combi combination. So it's uh, something like that, but it's field dependent. So you turn off the field, it stays inside. Either everything was clear or they need time to understand all the things I talked about. <laughs> Feel free to uh, ask me later, and you know, in, in one hour talk without a blackboard, uh, yeah. I thought the best to give an overview, and some of the physics should stay with you. No, you have brought them to the you know forefront, exactly showing that you know that where the situation is right now. So after that, we will uh, please feel, feel free to send emails. So everybody is accessible. If you send us also, we forward it to Tulpa Ma'am. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, once more, I, must, uh, I would like to emphasize that